I'm not going to say you need to for all installations, but the way it's going, um, it, it will be a requirement. Hello and welcome to another CEF Tech Talking podcast. Um, you've got myself, Darren, and you've got himself, Dave. Dave's on. Hello, Darren. <laughs> so we've got us in. Um, and we are rejoined by yeah. um, Michael from the IET. Michael Peaks, welcome back. Hi, we've been on a previous one. We've come to drill you again, Michael. Yeah, because you were so good last time, we really wanted to get into <laughs> some, some nitty gritty here. Because we heard a little rumour that you sit on subcommittee A. I don't sit on Subcommittee A. I'm the committee manager of Subcommittee A. Oh, so, what does that mean? You get the T's? What, what? Um, <laughs> nearly. Um, committee manager is BSI's new terminology for secretary. So we used to be the secretary oh, of the panels, got but we're you. now committee manager. And th- th- that change was made because it was felt that it uh, more accurately reflected what we did. So yeah. how influential are you on what happens then, or are you just recording what happens? I'm um, responsible for recording and um, organising the meetings, etc. Um, from the IET's point of view, we'll have a representative in the committee. So the IET are represented on that committee, but I'm purely management. So there's two of you. So, you, so there's yourself and someone else there representing. Um, the no, that, they'll be yeah, they'll be representing um, the yeah. IET. So they'll be able yeah, to yeah, actually yeah. take participate in the meeting, oh. where as me as committee manager, I'm like you say, more of organising. So when it comes to vote, you can't vote then. No, I'm oh. afraid not. No, I'm sitting on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> So what areas does the panel cover? So JPL 64A... Subcommittee, um, sorry, he, not panel. Yeah, you don't know, how dare you. Yes. You're not allowed to call it that anymore. I told I'm you. one of the old boys. I still <laughs> call them panels. You're not allowed to. They got rid of that. We've, we even changed the way, the, the, the name. So it used to be JPL A slash 64. Um, it, it, sorry, it used to be JPL 64 slash A. It's now JPL A 64. It's just the way uh, the computer did. Anyway, Lovely. what do you do when you're there? What we actually do is um, we're the committee responsible for verification. Although we have right. just... Last year, we've had a scope of work increase slightly, so we're now called verification and general aspects. But in the majority, we deal with parts one, two, and three, which mm-hmm. internationally is all part one, 60364 part one, yeah. and we deal with part six, so inspection and testing. Oh, Everybody's right. favourite. Here we go. <laughs> so did you... Were you part of the whole insulation resistance discussions then? I was there. Oh, <laughs> this is where you're allowed to get your responsibilities. Yeah. In. Uh, I, right. took, I took the notes. <laughs> right, right. Well, have a look at your notes because I've got some questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Dave and I have been going around uh, delivering the changes that have happened at Tech Talks, and um, we have been getting a little bit of disgruntledness from mm. the from the audience when we start to talk about insulation resistance tests, and it's all to do with the changes that happened in and around regulation. 643.3.3, allow me a moment, it says here, where connected equipment is likely to be influenced, uh, the measurement of the results, so yes, external equipment connected could influence the results, so this could be things with neons, things that are connected, down lighters, anything like that could, could affect it. It said the test or be damaged by the test, the test shall be applied prior to connection of such equipment in accordance with table 64. 64, the table there, is all about the test at 250, 500 or 1,000 volts. It then goes on to say, following connection of the equipment, a test at 250 volts shall be applied between live conductors and the protective conductor connected to the earthing arrangement. The insulation resistance shall have a value of at least one mega ohm. So the two parts to this, the first part is, it's, are we absolutely sure that you guys that do all of the stuff on your subcommittee are telling us we need to do a test before and after we do our second fix? I'm not going to say you need to for all installations, but the way it's going, um, it, it will be a requirement. Um, so back, back in the day, um, 16th edition, um, when we were apprentices, if we were going to carry out insulation resistance testing, we'd go along, make sure all the switches were closed, we'd remove all the GLS lamps, etc., and then we'd carry out a test. As we see in, in, in buildings now, we, we can't remove the lamps. They're all, they're all, all the fittings are all complete. Yeah. So... 
the, the, the first thing is the requirement in BS7671 is to test the wiring. We're not testing the equipment. That's been tested by the manufacturers. Um, so all we're testing is the wiring, and we must test the wiring at 500 volts. There are no questions regarding that. It must be tested at 500 volts, and it must be tested when the circuit protective conductors are connected to the earthing arrangement. This is a, this is a big mistake. Some people get a length of cable here and test it, but if the cable's actually snagged on the building, for instance, yeah. you, you won't identify we'll that. Um, and that's the same if you're using metal containment. So if you're using metal trunking, it's no good just testing between the singles. You need to make sure they're not snagged on the trunking, so we need to connect the trunking to the earth. Now, th this is, this is really important, Dave. If you're adding a circuit to an existing installation, what people will do is they'll run the final circuit back to the consuming or distribution board, and then I've seen so many times people will do a test, line to neutral, neutral to earth, earth to line. At that point there, yeah, it's safe to connect. It's not. Actually, what you just proved is you just proved them conductors aren't touching each mm. other. Mm. As Mike was said, you could be snagged on the tray, the trunk, in the conduit, whatever, the central heating pipe, something like that. At that point, you need to connect, terminate that CPC, then test between the line to earth of the installation. Yeah. And don't forget that earth to the installation across the bonding conductors, the CPCs that run out there, it should be finding all the other paths to earth that are there. And at that point, you are truly testing insulation resistance, aren't you? Yes. Yep. And that's the bit you're trying to get across here. It is, yeah. But just sort of questioning that, though, as a principle, in the sense that if there is a fault, as we've just described, say to the trunking, you don't need 500 to pick that up. The 500 is purely to check the veracity of the cable insulation, isn't it? It is, yes. So that would be picked up by a 250 volt test? Yes, it would, yeah, um, but that's not what's required. So the manufacturers require us to do a 500 volt test on the cables to verify the integrity of the cabling. Yeah, if you think about the process of the cable as it goes through its manufacturing, at that point it gets drawn, insulation applied to it, it gets stored. That's where the risk mm. starts to come in. Mm. It's where it's it's stored, it's transported, it's kept in installations or it kept it's kept in warehouses where it could drop below a temperature, go high on a temperature. We then go and install it without heating it up properly or whatever. And that's what manufacturers are really concerned with. They want us to make sure that we've installed it properly and at that point they really want us to put a stress test on. That's why the cable manufacturers are so absolutely adamant that we should be testing at 500 volts. Now, Michael, I've heard you make the point on a tech talk that it actually is quite a good insurance policy for yourself as well. If you've done the installation on site and then you're going to leave site on your first fix and then you're going to come back, if you do this 500 volt test on your initial installation, walk away. Somebody could do some damage while you're away. Yeah. Plumbers. Yeah. Let's just get it out there, right? <laughs> Put it out there now. Plumbers. It's always a plumber. <laughs> No, I used to, I used to have, have a bit of a relationship with the plasterers as well, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you, you, you do get that. You get it where your first fix is done, you think it's absolutely fine, and on your return, things aren't as you left them, are they? No. Now, I, I realise um, this is causing a, a little bit of um, trouble in the industry because th let's take a domestic installation first. It's, it's probably the yeah. easiest one to envisage. When we first fix our um, installation, we, we curl our cables up in the back of the box. Mm. They're not connected, so yeah. you can't really do an insulation resistance test at that stage very easily. Right. But at some stage, you're going to need to strip those cables when you come to put the socket outlet on. Um, so... What, what, we're, what we're suggesting is the best way is for you to... We've got all these lovely um, push-fit Vargo, Vargo connectors. That's <laughs> what you want. You want so, a pocket full of Vargo. So it doesn't take as long as what it used to. Um, and like I say, the, the insurance policy is you do your insulation resistance test at first fix. Yeah. You record the results. If you can, get somebody to witness it, even better. And then when you come back to start your second fix, before you even get the tools out of the van, get the tester... Put it back on the cables, make sure it's still as it was, and then you can start installing your equipment. Now, mm. after this point, you know that the wiring's okay, so you know then that you can use a 250-volt test, um, and then you can be sure that you're not going to damage any equipment. So, so the 250-volt test, you're saying, is just the the last test to be done on in initial verification just to prove that the accessories have been connected correctly. So one, the 500-volt is to prove that it's been wired correctly, and the 250 volt is to prove that it's been connected correctly. It's, it's, it's a quick and dirty check to make sure it's still in the same state as what it was when you did the 500 volt test. 
Um, I, I know we've got the reading there of one meg ohm, but I'm sure yeah. we all agree that that is extremely we, low. Yes. That is for um, a, a allowance for parallel circuits on the whole of the distribution yeah. board, where in reality nowadays, I think we probably test circuits individually. Um, yeah, you do see a lot of that. So a lot of practices, you, you do test individually. You go across the top of the MCBs when they're closed, so so or when they're open, sorry, so you're testing just that one part of it. So the takeaway from this is that that 500 volt test will be done. That's absolutely, to conform to the regs, that will be done. If you can manage that test with the equipment installed, because you know it can take that type of voltage, then you could just do the one test on the final yes. installation. Oh, no problem at all, uh, yeah. I'm glad you put that up, though. So, so, so we're talking here, the regulation uh, 643.3.3 .3 talks about a two-stage approach. However, if I know full well that my lights that I've picked, my new LED lights, can handle a 500-volt test, my switches, my sockets, they're okay at 500 volts as well. I've got some smoke detectors, they're okay at 500 volts. There's nothing in the installation that I'm going to connect, apart from probably an induction hob or something like that, that I probably won't look quite sure of, that I, don't, I, I shouldn't be putting 500 volts through. So if I isolate that induction hob and then I apply 500 volt as I normally would do, after second fix, I do my test at that part there at 500 Surely that negates the need for me to do it after first fix, does it not? Yeah, providing you're happy with that. Providing all the cables have been tested at 500 volts, yep. it doesn't matter what stage you do them at. And like I say, it'll be different um, per installation. So a domestic installation, you, there's going to be some element of connecting. Yep. But let's say a commercial installation, you've got a load of lighting trunk in, you've got all your bush sets all drilled out, you run your singles to your last fitting, and you yep. pull loops at all the other fittings. So that yep. test is quite easy to do. Yeah, yeah, you just do the one. Now... I, Although we're saying about the two tests, and it clearly says in here there's two steps approach to it, we've, we've looked at the form recently, Dave, haven't we? There's only one box to fill yeah. out now. There, there is only one box. <laughs> now, what you need to remember is that form, the um, generic circuit of schedule details and the circuit of test, schedule of test results, um, is there for the initial verification and periodic inspection. So right. you use the same forms for the EICR mm. as what you do the EIC. That's EIC. a difficult bit, isn't it? Well, Otherwise, well, you could just put five, the, t the 500 volt result, couldn't you? If it was just going to be used for verification. Initial verification, 500 volts, yeah, you could just put that back all the way through. Yes. Now, we were in... Oh, let me think back to the last Tech Talk we were in. We were in Cheltenham, Cheltenham. and some guy put his hand up. No, it wasn't. It was Bolton. Some guy put his yeah. hand up and said... We have to do 500 volts and 250 on periodic inspection reports. Yeah, not true. No. no. So this is, so let's get this right. This here that we're talking about is for initial verification only, isn't it? It is. And to be quite honest <coughs> with you, it's very unlikely, although it's not forbidden, that you're going to get to use 500 volts on an EICR. That's there's, what we're saying. There's real confusion on this, yeah. though, because this has caused a lot of confusion. We're getting people all the time asking, how do I do it on an EICR? Mm. Yeah. And again, th that that gentleman wasn't aware that you could drop it down to 250 no. volts for no. an EICR. So let, let's just see if I've got all of this quickly. <laughs> let's see if I can sum it all up. <laughs> let's sit in, there we go. Right, so on initial verification, the regulations are asking me, after first fix, it's suggesting I should be doing a 500 volt test after a first fix. That's hard to do. It's not impossible, but it's hard to do. So if I can do it, great. If I can't, and I'm absolutely fine that my second fix isn't going to be a problem at being tested at 500 volts. I can leave it. I don't have to test after first fix. I can go move. I can go straight to jail. I can go straight to put dude pass go. Go straight to second fix stage. And at that point, I can test at 500 volts. However, if I'm doing a warehouse conversion into loads of offices and there's loads of lights going up there, and I'm not sure whether they can withstand that 500 volt test at that part. Me as the in person carrying out the installation, I need to be aware, I think I should be doing a test here after first fix. And that's the one you'd record, the 500 volt test? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, it's important to remember though, um, we, we talk about the equipment not being able to withstand the 500 volts. It's also about some equipment will give you a misleading reading. They will, it's not yeah. just about damaging yeah. the equipment. Yeah. It'll give you a, for instance, some RCBOs will give you a dead short. Yeah, you're so. right. Yeah, yeah. So I think there we go. So lots more Vargos then. I mean, my wife loves them. They really screwed the washing machine up. <laughs> 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 you leave them in the pockets, I'll tell you now. <laughs> I mean, there are other things. You can get these, uh, I mean, most downlighters now come with these flow connectors, clipping bits yeah. and bobs. So there's lots of methods out there. So although, yes, it could be difficult, 
it's not impossible, is it? And I think that's what you guys are trying to put across here, that it's something that should be done. We should. Be, in fact, this isn't new, Dave. It's not new at all. It, it's just slipped, hasn't it? All, all, all we've done in, in, in this edition, in this amendment, sorry, is we've just tried to make it clearer. This was still in the 18th edition, um, but there was uh, an element of confusion, so we've tried our best to make it a little bit clearer. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. The insulation resistant testing. Clear as mud. <laughs> you heard it here first. Thank you, Michael. Your life is well spent on that, on that committee. <laughs> yes, thank you very much for listening to another CF podcast. Don't forget, if you've liked today, please share, like, and subscribe to what you're listening to. And we'll look forward to seeing you all next time on another CF Tech Talking podcast. Thank you.